Welcome aboard. This is Whale Watching and the inbound marketing show to help you land more whales. I'm Holly P. McCulley and I'm the niche inbound strategy expert. I'm Josh and I'm the HubSpot expert. We are with Protocol 80, an inbound marketing agency located in Bradford, PA. We specialize in working with B2B niche industries and you can find us at protocol80.com. And if you missed last month, you can check out our first episode here on the Sales Experts channel. I um, mean, you might notice this month things are looking a little different with us being um, on Zoom instead of in the studio, and we're upset about that, but we're excited for our topic today, and we're excited to give you guys a really great episode, um, so stay tuned for some tips and tricks. So overall, this show is for sales, service, and marketing professionals looking for inbound strategy advice and insights. Um, if you have issues driving traffic, converting leads, closing deals, ultimately, we're here to help. Um, the topic of this month's show is ABM and prospecting with an inbound mindset. Yeah, so we know that there's the old way of doing prospecting, which is kind of like purchasing lead lists, making cold calls, um, that kind of thing, mass emails, just being really kind of clogging up your leads in your prospect's inbox and their phone lines. Um, and then there's kind of the inbound way, which is doing some account-based marketing or ABM um, finding educated leads and that kind of thing. So we're going to talk about the difference there today. Um, and this could potentially be a two-parter depending on how much information we uncover here. So stay tuned. We might have some follow-up topics as well next month. Sounds great. Enough, Enough talking, talking around. around. <laughs> Let's set sail, shall we? Woo! <laughs> All right. So if you didn't tune in to last month's show, we have a section where it's Q&A where we create questions for each other about the topic uh, at hand. Now, the fun part about this is we don't know what each other wrote for questions. So we're coming to this um, without, without knowing. So we haven't prepared the answers. Uh, so they could be either right or maybe wrong. Uh, but either way, it's going to be our insight onto what the questions are. And hopefully, we'll have some fun with this. So uh, Holly, do you want to get us started? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and just as a note, any kind of resources or anything like that that we mentioned will be in the attachments tab on our show, so you can explore anything that we might reference there as well. So, Josh, are you ready? Yes. Okay. So, when you are starting to build a prospecting list or choosing companies that you want to execute an account-based marketing um, style strategy on, Where's your first place that you start in deciding kind of who makes the cut for prospecting or, you know, ABM? Because obviously there's a whole world of contacts and companies out there. So how do you start to whittle that down um, into a work withable list? A work withable list. <laughs> I would create my work withable list by starting with our buyer personas um, okay. and our ideal buyer profile. So like if we don't necessarily know um, the buyer persona yet, or who, who might be the person that I'm trying to reach with this initiative, I would start with ideal, that ideal buyer profile, which would be like, in our case, um, a manufacturing company, um, probably geographically located in the United States or uh, Canada, you know, 50 to 100 million in annual revenue, and usually um, tier one, tier two, tier three in the supply chain. So I would start to break that down and say, all right, now let's take this and, and hone in on a little more, a little bit more, because I know that I can't effectively uh, implement an ABM strategy by targeting everyone. It's got to be mm -hmm. uh, super targeted and ideally personalized as much as possible. And the only way that I can do that is by honing in on a smaller group of people. So I would then start to uh, break that down a little bit more based on a variety of factors. You know, I, I would um, do my own research first to say, you know, um, you know, maybe we do best from people geographically located within a couple hours of us, right? There's a lot of manufacturing companies within a couple hours of us. So if I start there, um, now I'm not looking at the entire United States and Canada. Mm -hmm. I'm now looking at a you know, 120 mile radius of uh, Bradford PA. It starts mm -hmm. to hone in a little bit more. And I would use a variety of those types of factors to make the list smaller and smaller and smaller. 
Mm -hmm. um, and eventually I need to identify, all right, well, we, we probably need like a director of marketing or maybe in some cases actually going to uh, the CEO or a C-level person at some point um, we're going to need to have that buying um, decision-making power there. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's a lot of different factors, but essentially I, I start with the best buyer, the buyer persona and the ideal buyer profile. That makes sense. Um, and we do have some resources on the P80 site for creating a buyer persona. So if this is the first time maybe someone out there is hearing of using buyer personas in a sales way, we can definitely include those in the attachments um, to get started. Because I think that that's a great point, Josh. You have to know who that ideal target audience is to at least get building block number one. Awesome. So then once kind of you have your list, is there any software that you recommend? Are there any tools? I'm assuming you're not just doing this all by hand and writing it all down. So what is a must for you from a tools and software perspective? Yeah. So from a tools and software perspective, there are a lot out there. I'll, I'll tell you my favorites um, and, and we can work from there. Uh, surprisingly, Excel is still one of my favorites. Uh, okay. So if I have a list and I have data uh, in that list, I might start by breaking down the, uh, the list by using uh, you know, filters or sorti sor sorting uh, <laughs> in Excel. Uh, I'm, you know, I've been using it for so long that it's, it's just a, a way that I can work efficiently to find the information that I need. Mm -hmm. so that's a tool that I like. I would then uh, take the data from there and populate that or import that into HubSpot. And uh, within the last, gosh, six months or so, um, HubSpot actually incorporated an ABM tool uh, into the HubSpot platform, uh, which allows you to organize the, uh, the target account companies by a variety of different aspects, whether it's industry, uh, tier one, tier two, tier three, uh, the owner of that particular account, um, the lead uh, or life cycle stage that they're in, whether they're a qualified lead, um, maybe an opportunity. I really like the tool and I think HubSpot did an awesome job uh, building that out and making it intuitive so we're not um, mm -hmm. wasting our time. You know, a, a couple of the other tools as I get into discovery that I really like, LinkedIn is always one of my go-tos uh, because mm -hmm. most businesses at, at, in this point um, are on LinkedIn, right? So you can start at that business level and start to identify and say, you know, I need to find engineers or I need to find buyers or whoever it may be, uh, start looking through um, LinkedIn, finding the companies and then finding the appropriate people um, at those companies. And then there's some other tools that you can use that maybe uh, make discovery if you're doing it on a, a higher volume, you know, more companies, more contact, uh, something like Zoom Info uh, would, would work really well because you can uh, work with larger data sets um, and export the data from there. And there's mm -hmm. a, a Zoom Info HubSpot integration to be able to send that information over. Or again, you could uh, use my method, download it, work with it in Excel, and then uh, import that into HubSpot. So, you know, there's a lot of tools out there, but those are probably my favorite ones. Mm -hmm. um, Excel, HubSpot. LinkedIn, Zoom info. I like to keep it simple. <laughs> yeah. And I know last time we talked about um, CRMs being kind of a major aspect of what we're going to talk about in all of our topics. So just wanted to hit again on the fact that we've not even made it through question two and we're already underscoring the value of a CRM. Do you think that there's any way in 2021 that a company can effectively prospect or do something like account-based marketing without having a CRM? No. Now, I think it'd be really difficult. I mean, you're yeah. losing, uh, you're losing so many factors that a CRM can can support. Uh, data yeah. being, you know, the number one. Sure, you can try to store, you know, your your outreach attempts and um, what happened as a result of that outreach attempt. Did they respond to an email? Did they open an email? Um, you know, who are the other uh, players at that company? Is this person mm -hmm. a decision maker? Sure, you can try to track and store all that information in Excel or something else, but mm -hmm. it's not going to be efficient. I think if you are serious about prospecting and an ABM strategy, a, a CRM of some capacity is a must. Um, yeah. Excel, Outlook, those types of things aren't going to uh, suffice for something that you're putting so much effort into. 
you might as well mm -hmm. make it worthwhile, use the right tools uh, so that you get the outcome that you're, you're hoping for. That makes sense. So we just talked about a lot of online avenues in terms of capturing things in a CRM, doing a lot of emailing and things. Are there ways to include offline avenues when you're doing prospecting and ABM with more of an inbound mindset? And what do you recommend when doing so? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's, um, it's, it's something that can take your ABM and prospecting uh, to the next level that your, your competitors maybe aren't doing or uh, the other people that are just creating noise in the space aren't right. doing um, by you know, incorporating maybe a direct mail piece or uh, um, a gift card for Starbucks or your local uh, coffee company if you're more of a local um, uh, targeting organization. Mm -hmm. I think by incorporating those offline things, again, you, you set yourself apart and showing that you're really taking the time to personalize uh, the message and uh, do your research and uh, that you care about connecting with that person. Even a handwritten letter would be cool right. to incorporate. Uh, into Definitely. And with, again, uh, most CRM tools, or I guess I should say some CRM tools, there are third-party services uh, that you can uh, queue up and integrate. So if you're at a certain point in the prospecting, like let's say it's, you know, I connected with this person um, and we had an introductory call and they were receptive, right? Mm -hmm. You label something or you mark something in the, C the CRM that says they, they were receptive to, to hearing our information. Mm -hmm. now, once that's labeled, the CRM automates the, the third-party tool or whatever it is to mm -hmm. automatically send out that offline thing, whatever that may be. Uh, whether it's a tchotchke or uh, uh, a gift card or a handwritten letter or something like that. No, I think that's a that's a really good tip, especially as it pertains to cutting through noise, because there's definitely a way to do, you know, digital ABM and digital prospecting in a way that is effective and can cut through the noise. But to even just compound it further, I think that that's a really creative idea. Thanks. I came cool. up with it myself. <laughs> well, that's actually all the questions I had for you. So hopefully those weren't too tough. <laughs> Good questions, all, uh, all important questions. Awesome. So I will ask you some questions now. Okay, okay. I think I'm ready. <laughs> uh, in your opinion, and we briefly kind of talked about this a little bit in the intro of the topic, but in your opinion, mm -hmm. what's the difference between modern prospecting um, and the legacy cold calling? How can you define this to maybe a sales rep that has been doing it this way for a really long time and they they're like well yeah it works what would you tell them <laughs> about modern prospecting so the way that I always explain this um, when talking with clients and, and such about this is it's when the old way of doing things um, is taking something away from that leader that prospect that you're trying to connect with so you're asking for their time you're cluttering up their voicemail, you're cluttering up their inbox, you're wasting their time, you're asking for their time and you're squandering it. Um, where I think the modern way of doing things, you're giving something, maybe you're giving a resource, maybe you're giving a tchotchke. <laughs> um, but there's something that they're out of each touch point, ideally, they're getting something that they didn't have before. Like I said, whether that's knowledge, a freebie, a free trial, something, and you're not just taking time leaving a bunch of voicemails, asking for a lot of their time to talk to you. Um, it's more of kind of a give and take relationship there. So I think that that's always where I start in defining the difference. Is that something you would agree with as well, Josh? I would agree, uh, definitely. I really like the explanation of, you know, taking something versus giving something, um, whether it's value or actually something. You know, as a follow-up right. to this um, and thinking about legacy sales reps and someone that's, um, very familiar or stuck in their ways. What, what do you think the learning curve is like uh, to switch from that old methodology to the new approach? I think the learning curve can be very steep, but it can be mitigated with software that makes sense and also training that makes sense and isn't just being crammed down a legacy salesperson's throat where like you have to use this. There's a why behind it, and there's kind of some logic and reason behind why we're using the tools that we're using and why they're actually helpful. So showing where time can be saved, whether that's through something like templates um, or even just 
I don't know, an easier way to store their contacts than before. So I think the learning curve is a lot steeper when it's like, here, use this. It offers no value to you. It's just more things you need to do. And I think that that can be mitigated with, hey, here's some stuff that um, adopting this philosophy can actually also take off your plate. Because at the end of the day, we're all pretty selfish people. Um, <laughs> and I know all salespeople want to help their prospects. They want to close more deals and that kind of thing. But sometimes that immediate grat gratification of, Something about this new process that saves them time can be really helpful. Yeah, agreed. All right, so that's a really good transition. You mentioned templates um, in the in the answer that you just gave. So, uh -huh. in a prospecting email, mm -hmm. uh, which is more important, the subject line mm -hmm. or the contents of the email itself? They're equally important. <laughs> Can I say, can I say you, both? You had to choose one, like 51%, 49%. I would say 51% subject line, 49% content, because your subject line is what gets you the open, the content is what gets you the reply. But I will also put the caveat in there that I guess it also kind of depends on the KPIs you're reporting on as well. Like are opens more important than replies? Because then that would shift the balance as well. And if replies are more important and opens don't really mean a heck of a lot to like maybe brand awareness and just being top of mind for your prospects isn't enough and you want that reply, then I think that would swing the balance in the way of content of the email. Um, ah, what do you think? That was a tough uh, one. I think I agree. It's a tough question because um, if you don't get them to open, then the content is moot anyways. Right. Um, I think one of the challenges, especially that we're facing in this pandemic world where email has increased uh -huh. um, and maybe even laziness to a certain extent has increased. That's an opinion yeah. that's not based on facts. Um, Pull up the chart. It, <laughs> Josh's chart, laziness increased yes. 100%. <laughs> um, I, I think it's just harder to break through the clutter, which kind yeah. of... Uh, increases the need for a subject line that you can't immediately tell is this is someone that doesn't know me um, yeah. and they're just trying to annoy me. I mean, obviously it's not the end goal, but that's what I see when I see a non-personalized, every other person in the world uses the same subject line yeah. as an email. I would say though, it can be equally as frustrating to have, you know, like an 80% open rate on an email and a 0% reply rate because you went with something that was clickbaity and offered no value. That's really going to get people to unsubscribe well. Um, is if, you know, you're getting these things that are open, but then there actually is no value in the email itself. So I will say they're both pretty close to equally important. And just some quick things you can do to help improve open rate in a meaningful way. So we've talked before about including video voicemails in your prospecting and in your ABM. So using some tools like Vidyard, which is free, you can record those kind of one-to-one, one, one to few, one-to-many videos. Um, if you put in a subject line that you, you're leaving a video voicemail, that can improve open rates, but it's specifically proven to improve open rates, as well as like you mentioned, personalization, first name, their company name, that kind of thing can definitely help. And also letting them know what value they're gonna get from opening the email in the subject line. So if it's like video voicemail and a resource for you, that can help as well because you're then you're telling them what they're going to get. They're opening the email. They're getting it. That's all around a positive experience. That's uh, another good transition. And I swear Holly didn't know <laughs> um, these questions prior to uh, asking them. So prospecting um, or sorry, sorry, sorry. Let me go back. Still a transition. Wrong question. Uh, what are some <laughs> recommendations that you have for personalizing outreach of a prospecting strategy beyond first name, company name? Yeah, so I think you touched on one of these things earlier when you were talking about segmenting your list as well. And sometimes I think depending on the way that you've segmented your ABM and your prospecting list, there can inherently be some personalization in there. So for example, if you are targeting just a specific industry, you know, maybe you're targeting just people in automotive who produce a certain type of part. Um, and yes, there may be 15 people on that list who all do the same type of thing, but you can include language that's really specific to them and their applications and their pain points in those emails. So that can help it feel more personal and kind of two birds, one stone there. Um, I don't, is it okay to say two birds, one stone? I think so. Okay, I didn't know if that was too violent for the show. 
Uh, it is family friendly programming. 2021, well. anything goes. All right, cool. Um, and then another really great way um, that you can personalize is by asking questions that can feel really personal because it shows that you care. Um, so that can be great. Again, personalization tokens, I think are the bare minimum at this point. Everyone knows that personalization tokens exist. So they have to be there, but they shouldn't be your crutch because anyone and anyone can use them. Um, I think those are kind of my main things. Oh, and like you said, Josh, LinkedIn stalking. Um, so I love your example of you don't want to go like eight months back on their Instagram and like reference a bikini picture of theirs. But if they volunteer in their local community in a similar way to the way that you volunteer, or if there's something there that would be a genuine talking point if you were to meet this person in person, I think that can be helpful as well. Um, and I think sometimes a little bit of humor can help there too. Like, hey, I was creeping on your LinkedIn a little bit to, to you know, before I touched base and I noticed you volunteer XYZ, I do the same thing. So that can be something really great as well. Not great for like a ton of prospects. You don't want to do that for every single person that you're reaching out to because that would be super time consuming. But those really big whales that you care about a ton, I would say that's another great thing to include. Yeah, and that's a really good point. You know, when I mentioned earlier, when I'm making my list, I can't have a list of, um, a thousand people or even really a hundred people. Like if I'm going to personalize the message, which is going to be the only thing that's going to cut through the noise, I can only personalize for a small group of people and make it mean. Right. So that's, I think a good focus. A couple other things we've done uh, in the past would be like incorporating um, a logo on the landing page if they mm -hmm. click, uh, where it's like, oh, this is cool. This is like a landing page that was built for me. Mm -hmm. uh, the video that you mentioned, you know, yeah. video can be very personalized. I know some uh, people will pull up the website of the person that they're prospecting or have a sign that's like, hey, Julie, nice to yeah. meet you or something <laughs> like that, right? Those types of things uh, can help as well. And I think that's a conversation to be had with your team and, you know, even just like with yourself about what priority is, because we talk about personalization in terms of like one-to-one, one-to-few, one-to-many. So obviously one-to-one -one being a personalized video that has their name in it, has their LinkedIn info, it only works for that person. One-to-few is like, this works for maybe, you know, a dozen people, this level of personalization. One-to-many is, you know, it works for maybe 30, 60 people. And obviously you're losing effectiveness as you move away from that one-to-one, -one, but it's worth noting that like a one-to-few is still more effective than a mass marketing email. So just weighing how much these prospects mean to you versus how much time you want to put into personalization is important. Cool. Um, I have two more questions. Okay. Uh, I got, I snuck in a few extra questions by asking a secondary question. So I did. Uh, prospecting is usually considered a sales activity. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you, how much do you rely on marketing research when creating sales prospecting uh, activities or creatives? I think um, it can be relied on with as much data as you have. So a really good example of this is if you do have like a CRM that's hooked into your website and is tracking like page visit activity, that can be such a crucial asset to sales. Um, because if you know that prospects have seen a certain page on your website and then you have the data where like, okay, 90% of website visitors then also went to this page and then this page through your sales process, you know what your prospects are probably looking for if they're researching around these topics or if they're interested around these topics, maybe they just haven't discovered those assets on the website yet. So in the interest of giving, um, if you know that, you know, these three to five blogs on your site are the most visited in this topic, um, but this prospect is totally new to you, send them those three to five blogs that tend to do well and not the 12 that, you know, nobody ever sees. So I think that's a really great way to include marketing and also just, you know, the writing in general. Um, sometimes it can, you can get in your own head, you can be writing these really long wordy emails. So sometimes it helps to have marketing there to really like optimize it you know, keep it tight, end in a question, that kind of thing, I think can be helpful as well. So really, I would say marketing can get involved depending on the level of data you have. The more data, the better, the more you can pass off to sales about lead behavior of people who are already on your site. And then you can take that information and use that for prospecting an ABM. Great. Was that it? Yeah, that's all of my questions. Whew. I get so nervous before these. I'm afraid you're going to ask me something like, what was the average email open rate for prospecting emails in 2020 or something? You know what? As a bonus question, I'll ask you this. Okay. You may or may not be able to answer it. What was the last okay. thing that you purchased as a result 
of someone prospecting you? Do like, does that have to be individualized prospecting or can I admit that sometimes, um, so there's this company called From You Flowers um, and that's where I order flowers for like my grandparents, my mom, like friends for their birthdays. And once I order, let's say I ordered someone flowers on December 10th, like I will get an email on like December 8th. That's like, Hey, don't forget to order. And then that person's first name flowers for their birthday. And they log all of that info just based on last year, I ordered this person flowers and I checked that it was a birthday and they sent like a birthday thing with it. So they store all of that and then they really make me feel guilty and it absolutely works because even if it was like just because flowers, I sent my Grammy last year for something, you know, like I, like it, it, when they message me and they're like, Hey, don't you want to send your Grammy some just because flowers? How am I going to be like, no, like I don't screw my Grammy. She doesn't get flowers. Like I'm never going to say that. So it works. Um, and I think like to tie that back to something that is actually a takeaway for people watching, like, I think that's the importance of a CRM. Like the more information you log and track, and then can automate and get in places, it actually works. So target people's grandmothers and get a CRM is the, I think the takeaway there. Perfect. <laughs> what um, about you? No, I, I don't buy anyone flowers, so. Really? Yeah. Well, that's tragic for the people in your life. <laughs> no, I don't know that anyone has ever like been like, gosh, I wish Josh would send me some flowers. <laughs> Maybe your prospects. Maybe that's where you should start Maybe. with. <laughs> Maybe they just die though. Yeah, that's true. So I love flowers. It's, it's actually more sad than anything if you think about it. I just disagree. All right, so uh, on to the next segment of our show. At this point in our show, we usually do the inbound tower game where we pull mm -hmm. out a uh, piece of the Jenga game and it has something written on it that is inbound related and then we talk about it. But because yeah. of COVID and us doing this video via Zoom or this interview via Zoom, mm -hmm. we're not gonna do it this month. But if our viewer wanted to get their monthly fix of Jenga, we're gonna include some links to some Jenga fails um, where you can briefly watch that on your own time. Yeah, also, um, which is what I thought Josh was going to say, but he didn't. So <laughs> that's why I held this up. If you're wondering what this is, these are um, from our last episode. We talked about anchor links, for example, on the first episode. So if you want to go back and watch that, that also would be a good way to get your Jenga fix um, if you haven't seen it already. Or if you have, rewatch it, share it with your family, you know, that kind of thing. Cool. cool. So now we'll transition into our next segment, which is our interview, one of our favorite segments of the show. Last month, yeah. we interviewed Kevin Must of Lantac. Kevin did a great job, a lot of great information. Uh, this month, we're interviewing Trig V. Olson of BusyWeb. I've known Trig V for several years now, and I will say that Trig V is one of the um, best prospecting people uh, that I know. So I'm really interested to hear what Trig V has to say about prospecting in, in ABM. Awesome. Yeah, roll the interview. All right. So this month on Whale Watching, our special guest is Trig V. Olson from uh, BusyWeb. Uh, Trigvi, do you want to do a quick intro to yourself and your company? Sure. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Trigvi. I'm the Director of Business Development at BusyWeb. We're a growth marketing agency that's based in Minnesota. We primarily focus on uh, service-based consumer businesses. So this, this month's episode of Whale Watching uh, is about prospecting. Yeah. And um, to... We're really digging in on modern prospecting versus old school uh, cold calling. Sure. So in, in your opinion, um, how would you define modern prospecting? So I think the difference is, is that in any old school prospecting job, you have a phone and a phone book and somebody says, hey, good luck. Go to it. Get, <laughs> go, go crazy. And oh, by the way, if you're not at 100% of plan, but at 90 days, you're out. Um, you find that a lot, especially in the recruiting world, is call everybody. Everybody needs to hire somebody. Well, that's not really true. And then that doesn't mean that they're going to hire you to help them and help them do anything. So the, the newer generation of prospect is focusing more on providing an actual tangible, physical, real thing that can make a difference in somebody's life. 
and talking to that first. So if I call you, Josh, I will have looked at your LinkedIn profile. I will have looked at your Facebook and your Instagram profile. I would looked at your company profile and tried to figure out what would I have done better or what have I, or I have done differently in order to be more constructive. And then I'm going to call you and say, hey, I've got an idea. Can we talk about the idea? And then if somebody says no, you say, okay, great, good luck. Because th there is no more brute force selling, especially when you're dealing in something like what we do, which involves developing a relationship. And if somebody's not ready to have the relationship, they're not going to have the relationship. Mm -hmm. Now, I, there's probably some great marriage analogy to be had there, but I, it, it escaped <laughs> me at the moment. But um, you have to you, you have to recognize that there is a problem and sometimes you can be told that there, there is a problem but then you the next step in the sales process is to help people realize that there is a potential solution so some of that is how you talk to people but it's actually the the first step is is, is having a real genuine sense of i can help i think you can do some things better i think you can have more growth if we decide to work together I, I think that's an awesome, uh, genuine answer. I really like that definition. One of the things, uh, Trigby, that I've always respected about you and um, your ability to prospect is you go at it and you seem to be fearless and you have fun with it. I've seen some of the videos that you've sent <laughs> and they're great. Um, well, thank you. How do you approach it? How, or how would you recommend to someone else to approach prospecting and not have that fear of, you know, they're going to hang up on me or whatever, and to maybe make it fun while you're doing it. Well, I think those are two different questions is, 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 and really kind of gets into a third overall point. Um, what I am sort of gregarious and somewhat of a character. And so if anybody's going to work with me, they're going to have to realize that up front. But ultimately, anybody in our daily lives are just surrounded by a cacophony of noise, either online or offline. It's just, there's always a buzzing of things and people wanting a bit of your time, a little, little something like that. So um, what I find is that sometimes if you say the same thing over and over again, it just sounds stale and it doesn't sound interesting. So there's a, there's a need to be had to um, change it up a little. And then maybe ask people uh, to, to think of something in a different way. So when, when, when you apply that lesson of prospecting, it's, it, you have to, number one, be genuine. And number two, sometimes you just have, your job is to get people to talk to you. And you can do that however, by any means necessary. Sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes it does work. Um, you know, that's a great anchorman line that 60% of the time it works every time. But I prefer to think of it of uh, instead of doing the same thing over and over and over again, you know, there's some people who are built for that, but it, it, when you're dealing with rejection all the time, which is what prospecting is, it, 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 it wears on you after a while and it has to stop. And so have something fun, have something different. One of the things that, that, that we do is we tend to prospect together and we make it interesting that way so we can give real-time feedback on calls and then or you can have a buddy so it's not just you against the phone it's you and your buddy against the world sometimes we even play a game we like to call secret word where um if we're on a call it, if if it's it's your turn josh to, to to prospect and call one of your prospects i will give you a secret word that you have to say sometime in the contact in the course of your call and it can be as any words i want like kerfuffle or hootenanny so now you need to figure out how to say hootenanny sometime <laughs> in your next call. And That's so awesome. then it becomes contextually interesting, but it also keeps you out of thinking, oh God, what if they hang up on me? Oh God, what if they, I, I don't want to have another failure? Because now, now you, there's a goal to be achieved. And that, help, that helps me emotionally get through a lot. <laughs> That's great. I think Holly had some questions for you as well. Actually, one of my main questions was about group prospecting. That was something that Josh had mentioned when he was telling me about your areas of expertise and why he wanted to, you know, bring you on today. And um, I was just very intrigued by that idea. And one of the things I had jotted down to ask was, what do you find works? So I think we definitely got some good tips for that. Oh. But what doesn't work? If someone's intrigued by that idea and they want to try, have there any been, have there been any 
shortcomings or failings of group prospecting that you've seen? Any roadblocks we should tell people to avoid? I think you do have to understand that even in the best of scenarios, you're probably not going to motor through a lot of calls. So I, I think one of the typical KPIs that a lot of salespeople have is a certain amount of calls per week. Mm -hmm. And if you dedicate the time to do that, 50% of the time needs to be about you and 50% of the time needs to be about somebody else. So mm -hmm. could you fit in, you know, four or five more voice messages during that time? Sure. Uh, it, it, can it be helpful? Sure. So there is, you still need to make time to put in the work in order to get the results. I think is one. And second, it has to be somebody that you jive with and somebody that you really it is helpful you know if you mm -hmm. it's it's no fun if somebody's just telling you everything that you did wrong you have to make sure that you're complimentary and helpful which it's it's funny because i was mean to somebody i work with today and i feel terrible about it and i i, I didn't do that thing so it's on top of mind for me today the one thing that i do want to say that i i mentioned earlier is josh mentioned that uh, he thinks of me as being fearless and that's not true at all. I am constantly fearful of, for my job, for my family, for my safety, for my life all the time now in these days. You know, I think of prospecting as it's much like being a baseball pitcher. It is you and then you can either win or lose the game by yourself. But eventually you do have to come, you do have to work on overcoming that fear. And that's something that's going to be unique to every single person who's watching this, every single mm -hmm. person who's listening to this. It is a real and genuine thing. And there is no formula that I can give you that tells you that it's going to, everything's going to be okay. A lot of times the way that I get through it is by being fuzzy bear and being fun and gregarious and, and, and being interesting, but it, it, it gets to everybody. And so the only, the, the best suggestion that I can make is oh, actually own the fear and actually own that, you know, you don't like it. So if you have somebody who's hung up on you or really mean or rude to you, well, okay, then maybe put the phone down for an hour and do something else because we've all mm -hmm. got other things to do. But don't, don't try it, especially when we talk about modern prospecting, there's this old sort of machismo, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, just get tough it just and, and just battle through it. I don't believe that at all. If you really want to be genuine and put yourself out there in prospecting, then it means you're going to get hurt sometimes. And if you get hurt sometimes, you have to recognize that you are hurt and that's legitimate and figure out and, and take the time to process that. Great. Yeah, that's so, awesome. Trigby, you were an awesome guest. Well, thanks, guys. Uh, it's again, a pleasure to be here. Coming, coming at us from warm and sunny Minnesota, uh, yep. <laughs> growth uh, marketing agency. Trigby, what's I'll the best down so way people can see the? Uh, what's yeah, the best way for them to get in touch with you if they're interested in connecting? You can visit us on the web at busyweb.com. Uh, I am uh, also available. Uh, you can probably call Josh and say, "Hey, who's that good-looking guy? And can I have his phone number instead?" But uh, busyweb.com is, and you can find us on all the typical socials as well. Awesome. Thanks again, Trigby. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me, guys. Thanks so much. Thanks again for joining us, Trigby. If you'd like to get in touch with him, we've linked his LinkedIn profile in our show notes. Um, and if you'd like to be a guest or if you know someone who would be interested in potentially talking about some inbound marketing and sales topics, feel free to send us an email at whalewatching at protocolad.com and we will definitely consider you. I'm not saying we'll take you, but we'll consider you. But if you want to increase your chances, if you want to include like a bad joke with it, that might help as well because that's kind of our thing. Or if you send Holly flowers. Or if you send me flowers, yes, I can add them to my collection for my adoring fans. Um, <laughs> so next we're going to move into our mailbag portion, which is uh, kind of all of the questions that we've received after the last episode, which if you remember was about goal setting. So we had some people write in some questions and we're going to read them and answer them now. Josh, do you want to lead us off? Sure. Uh, we have a question here from a gentleman named Mike. Mike says, hi, Josh and Holly. What is your method for working through sales lulls like we had last year? Everyone had a stretch where deals weren't moving along or dropped off entirely. Oh gosh, that's a tough question. And I know um, it was an interesting year last year. Some people, uh, some people had a growth year where they really, they thrived and they uh, were able to, I don't want to say take advantage, but the situation suited them well, I guess. 
Um, yeah. So that we're able to have a great year. But I also know there were a ton of businesses that that struggled and it, and it was super sad to, to hear and have those conversations. But I think the ones that were able to um, adapt and adjust and keep pushing through and um, trying to make those things happen as opposed to just abandoning ship um, were the ones that just kind of fall, adjusted but followed the path, right? Mm -hmm. So if, if prospecting wasn't working or if their traditional email wasn't working or if paid search stopped working, they either looked and said, well, what do we need to change about our approach or do we need to try uh, a new approach? So, so I think mm -hmm. anyone that was able to remain agile and, and kind of push through and do their best um, and adapt, I think that those were the ones that, that we're successful and you know next time something like this happens hopefully you know not this Never. major but <laughs> sales wall is you look at what's working um do more of it what's not working fix it adjust and try to be as objective as possible when looking at it as opposed to uh bringing feelings into it and saying well i think this should work because i don't know i loved doing it or or whatever that may be yeah i i hope that answers your question mike um you know sales laws suck but you know as a business, we have to get through them. Definitely. Um, so this next one here is from Carlos. It says, hello, Josh and Holly. We're brand new to inbound, so we have limited data to motivate our content strategy. Where is the next best place to look? Um, so actually, this is pretty common for us when we take on a new client, just because they're usually pretty new to marketing. Um, so the number one place where I recommend starting is to start with your sales team, actually. Talk to them and see what type of content they think would be valuable through the sales process. Um, so, you know, whether that's they know that they always get these five questions on the first call that they have with someone. Well, that's a great blog post to write right there. Or if there's a PDF that um, they would love to be able to hand off, because if there's someone who's already in the sales funnel, or already a decently qualified lead. Uh, those are probably the type of people you want to continue to pull in. I mean, even reflecting on maybe some uh, deals that didn't go that well. Is there anything that content could have supported that would have helped that in any way, um, whether that's website content, blog content, or downloadable content? So I definitely think the, the key to success lies within your sales team. So definitely go to them first. Yeah. And um, thank you. Okay, go. Cool. <laughs> one of the other things I would just add to that, uh, low traffic period. I mean, you could also look at things like paid search. Yeah. Uh, to support and um, supplement as long as it's still done from a strategic inbound approach. Absolutely. That's a good point to kind of kickstart uh, those eyeballs on those blogs once you start writing them. So before we get into our closing thoughts, uh, we just wanted to remind you that Whale Watching airs on the third Thursday of each month in 2021. So our next show airs March 18th at 1 o'clock p.m. Eastern. Uh, mark your calendars now. Main takeaways from this uh, this this discussion, I think, is you, you have to have a CRM. Mm -hmm. um, be diligent about doing the activities, and those activities should be personalized. If I were to TLDR my closing thoughts. Yeah, I think one of the things that I heard both of us mention in a variety of different ways but feels very important is making sure that you're attuned to what your sales team can accomplish. Um, because it seems like a lot of times that we kept harkening back to that maybe being the downfall. Um, so I think that that's really important just to have candid conversations with your sales reps and not, you know, ask for the moon and hope if you miss, you'll land among the stars because you probably won't. You're going to end up flat on your face and nobody's going to, no prospects have been reached out to and that kind of thing. So I would just make sure that you're having those open, honest conversations with your sales reps about what's possible before you launch a prospecting or ABM strategy. Yeah, I think that ties directly into our conversation about lists as well. You know, mm -hmm. our lists are so big that we can't perform those activities because everything needs to be personalized. So a small targeted list um, of real uh, prospects that could be a good fit for you would be much better than just a list of every company that has been incorporated in your, you know, right. within the last <laughs> five years. Right, right. Um, all right, so that's our show. We want to thank Deb Calver and her team at the Sales Experts channel, and thank you guys for watching. And if you haven't, please leave a review and uh, comment in the racist tab. And we'll see you next time. Huh? Hopefully in person. Well, are in person. Yeah, they can't come to the studio either way. Maybe next year. <laughs>
<laughs> maybe next year. Big enough Thanks, scoop. everyone. We can have a live audience. Yeah, that'd be fun. Okay, bye. <laughs>